did. Awesome. Perfect. Everywhere around us, communication and technology is advancing. Both seen and unseen, there is a growing cybernetic collective, a near seamless connection from device to device, and ultimately, human to human. The Curiosity Lab at Peachtree Corners, Georgia, provides a 500-acre, real-world environment that features a mile-and-a-half autonomous vehicle test track and smart city living laboratory for testing and integration of new technologies. A highly advanced infrastructure that includes intelligent traffic signals, solar roadways, embedded charging coils, smart cameras, and street lights, and additional sensors that are all interacting via mobile 5G. Smart mobility enhanced vehicles automatically detect and communicate directly with each other for both collision avoidance and traffic optimization. This is a truly special destination, a gathering point where thought leaders and designers research new products and services, testing interconnectivity and performance, and collaborate with other great companies in a real-world environment with all its unpredictability. Current and next generation private and commercial vehicles share the open road with the pedestrians walking to work and families enjoying the day. In the near future, phones and tablets will display three-dimensional renderings of the environment in real time from the vast array of data available along the route. There is an active and modern lifestyle here. It draws local cyclists to our streets where safety is enhanced by our cycling computers and mobile devices that transmit their location, direction, and velocity directly to approaching vehicles and surrounding monitoring devices. And they also receive back alert messages of vehicle proximity. Imagine now runners with next generation wearable technology, communicating their location in real time to vehicles on the road while their heart rate and workout data is being transmitted to their family and friends at home. Unfortunately, the smart city IoT streets of the future present exponentially more breach points that hackers will be looking to exploit. Next generation cybersecurity must be tested and strategic cyber resiliency strategies deployed to provide real-time countermeasures. Our future is an exciting one where driven vehicles and driverless vehicles, humans and humanoids, coexist in an unparalleled testing dynamic, both on the ground and in the air. This is a robust and unchoreographed final proving grounds for V2X technologies and beyond. New tech companies are finding their genesis here and existing companies are developing new concepts and refining technology that enhances and supports the array of products and services being tested here. Join us on this exciting new journey, a journey of discovery at a truly unique location where human intelligence, artificial intelligence, and smart mobility converge. Let's grow together and learn from each other now and in the future. Welcome to the Curiosity Lab at Peachtree Corners. The Curiosity Lab is where technology goes to be tested after graduating from a closed laboratory environment. This is here. This is now. This is Curiosity Lab at Peachtree Corners, Georgia. Have you ever wondered how Chandler managed to become the autonomous vehicle capital of the world? Our 
urban and suburban landscapes, robust highways, city streets, and varied weather conditions make Chandler the perfect place for AV to test and grow toward the future. Waymo, formerly known as the Google Self-Driving Car Project, first brought autonomous vehicles to the area in 2016. Currently, the company operates out of a 39,000 square foot warehouse where it has ramped up its testing, launched an early rider program, and is moving toward commercial deployment. In addition to Waymo, Chandler is also home to Intel's autonomous vehicle lab, Mobileye, and many other leading AV technology companies. As AV in the area started to grow, the city took unprecedented steps to make Chandler the nation's leader in AV accessibility. In June 2017, the city's police and fire departments teamed up with Waymo engineers to create a controlled environment that would simulate road conditions involving autonomous vehicles. In 2018, the city became the first to adapt its zoning code to accommodate the increased use of autonomous vehicles. Chandler's continued commitment to innovation has allowed AV to grow and prosper in the valley. In March of 2019, Waymo announced yet another plan to expand in the area. From here, the future of AV in Chandler looks bright, with city leaders committed to growth and innovation and an adaptable zoning code, Chandler continues to solidify its reputation as the innovation and technology hub of the Southwest. Like there's a ghost, a ghost at the steering wheel. I kind of feel like royalty being paraded around in this thing. School zone. Look at these guys. Look it over. Are they? <laughs> no driver. Go! What? This way my thing is cruising. <laughs> oh, it's a pretty sharp turn. They made it pretty smoothly. Thank you. Do I say thank you? here. We made it and I didn't have to drive. Wow. Pretty amazing, right? We thought we would share with you those um, three videos as a kind of um, level set for the panel. You know, you talk about the automated vehicles in the future of cities. Those videos capture that feeling perfectly. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Uh, to this panel, we've got a terrific lineup of panelists here for you to discuss exactly that, automated vehicles in the future of cities. I uh, would like to introduce my co-host, Di Bowman. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening and to everybody here. Thank you so much for spending a bit of your day with us. I'm Di Bowman. I'm an Associate Dean and Professor at ASU Law and the Co-Director for the Center for Smart Cities and Regions. Great. We thought we would just jump right into it and have our panelists introduce themselves. Uh, give a brief background about what they're working on, and then we'll jump right into the, the dialogue for today. So uh, maybe we'll follow the order of the videos and have Brandon, you start first. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you, Dad, for having us. Um, Brandon Branham, I have the pleasure of serving as the Assistant City Manager and Chief Technology Officer for the City of Peachtree Corners. And one of the initiatives that we're working on, as you saw in the video, is Curiosity Lab at Peachtree Corners. And this is an economic development initiative for the city where we took the things that cities are experts in, right? Infrastructure, we own, operate infrastructure across our cities. And that's one thing that the private sector does not have. Um, and so we took that, invested a little over $5 million into it, and then opened up the sandbox for the private industry to come and use it for free. Awesome, thanks for joining us. I'm sure we'll deep dive into a lot of that in a little bit. Uh, Micah, over to you and Chandler. Hey, thanks, Dom. Mike and Miranda, I'm the Economic Development Director here in the, the city of Chandler, uh, southeast portion of the greater Phoenix region, home to quite a few technology companies, uh, both within the, the AV space and external space. So excited to be here. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, thanks for joining. Ellie, over to you. Hi, thanks for having me, Dominic and I. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ellie Casson. I'm the head of city policy and government affairs at Waymo. 
Uh, and as you saw in the video, uh, Waymo is an autonomous vehicle technology company. Um, we're based in uh, California, headquartered in California, but have a really big footprint in Arizona. Um, and we're excited to talk about uh, our work there and specifically our partnership with the city of Chandler and uh, the public sector. Um, we couldn't have come as far as we have with, without those things. Awesome. We're excited. Yeah, we're excited to have you, especially here in Arizona. Thanks for joining us. And Jeff, don't want to make you feel bad about not having a, an awesome video, but maybe that's something we can work on with <laughs> I am, but please introduce yourself. I was, I was going to say, I, I didn't realize there was a show and tell. So uh, th thanks, uh, Dom and, and Di, for having me and for, for inviting me to this esteemed panel. Uh, Jeff Wishart, I'm a managing engineer at Exponent. Exponent's a scientific and engineering consulting firm. Uh, head, headquartered in Menlo Park, but uh, our biggest footprint is here in Arizona, where we have a two-mile oval and a 150-acre, we call it engineering playground. Um, I'm also adjunct faculty at ASU in the automotive systems program, and my research and, and work uh, is in vehicle electrification, automation, micromobility, and, and fuel economy and emissions. That's kind of run a little bit of the gamut. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me, and, and thanks for everybody for, for attending. Yeah, of course. This is going to be an exciting conversation. So why don't we jump right in? Micah, let's, let's turn to you. You know, with City of Chandler has become kind of nationally known as this autonomous uh, vehicle hub, um, not only in Arizona, but like I said, around the, the country. How did, how did Chandler do that? How did you become this, this well-known hub for autonomous vehicles? Well, I, I think we had the necessary ingredients years ago, many decades ago, as a matter of fact. Um, our history really as a community stems from technology manufacturing coming out of the uh, semiconductor industries, um, you know, and the associated supply chain. So when you look at an autonomous vehicle, it's the sum of a lot of different components. And a lot of those components were uh, manufactured in Chandler, engineered in Chandler. And so as AV began to develop, in, uh, Intel primarily was one of the, the driving factors here on the, the hardware and software side and a lot of smart people well, then Intel spun out and had done a, a lot of um, unique things. And Chandler is also home to Intel's uh, IoT, Internet of Things Research Center, which allows for a lot of new ideas to be, to be uh, thrown around. Um, also home to uh, Ollie. Uh, we saw that in, in the video earlier, uh, running around in Peachtree, which is very cool. Their headquarters is here in Chandler. They do their manufacturing engineering here. And then with Waymo coming on in uh, 2016 or so, the city partnering with them around, you know, the, the testing environment. Um, there's a lot of natural advantages of testing in Chandler for autonomous vehicle technology. And, and the other part of it that I think really allowed us to be seen and capitalize on this new industry is our community. Chandler uh, as a community is a very early adopter of technology. We have a lot of um, individuals, as a matter of fact, 25% of the workforce in Chandler is in advanced manufacturing or software. So those um, individuals were very receptive to this. And so when we started working with Waymo early on, there was a lot of excitement around uh, what this could potentially mean uh, for our community. So it just, it really rolled from there and uh, we've continued to embrace it both as an organization at the municipal level and as a community to see how we can use this technology to better our lives. That's a, let me just double click or double click on that real quick, Micah, because you're right, you know, the community in Chandler has been very accepting of these technologies, but also your elected leaders have been as well. I mean, did that provide kind of that necessary boost, you know, as other communities around the country are looking to really drive the sort of emerging technologies, especially around automated vehicles, you know, how important is it to have those elected leaders out talking to the community about these technologies? It's very important. And, and it's also really important from the private sector as well. And I'll give a lot of our um, technology companies uh, credit. They were very proactive, engaging with the community, um, being very responsive um, to concerns, obviously, when anything new is being deployed, people have questions. And uh, Waymo, Intel, Ollie, and all the other organizations who are practicing in this space have been receptive to taking feedback, sometimes criticism, and using it to make the um, um, community more comfortable and uh, achieving buy-in, which is why, um, you know, when we first launched this, there was people 
like, why are you doing this? What's the benefit? You know, they're, they're everywhere now. And then, you know, I look at my window today and I, I see Waymo's constantly and I see Intel's cars rolling around and it's just another vehicle on the road. So it's really been um, driven uh, from both the private sector side and the community side on education, communication, because, you know, we do share these roads with the public and we want to make sure there's a lot of comfort and acceptance around it and transparency. Awesome. I'm going to jump in and first I'm going to make this about me clearly. Um, I'm so excited about this panel. I've been working in road safety on four different continents now for approximately 18 years and the issue of protecting vulnerable road users is one that we have not dealt with well and yet we see potentially a paradigm shift here with automated vehicles. So I'm delighted to be moderating this and I'm looking forward to getting to that part of the discussion as well. But I want to turn Dominic's question over to Ali in a slightly different way. Um, for the private sector, working with the public sector is not necessarily the easiest and there's usually some challenges, but this has been obviously a really successful partnership for the city of Chandler and Waymo. And Ali, I'd love to hear that, a little bit about that process and how it has got to the stage that it has um, and also how you're leveraging what you learned with working with Chandler to be able to then go out and work with other cities and towns across the United States. Sure. Thanks, Diane. And Micah, thanks for everything you shared. Um, a lot of what you said, uh, I think I would have shared. So I'll try to build on on that um, and, and say that, you know, we are fortunate that there's enthusiasm for our technology in not all but many cities in America and I think part of that is because of what uh, Chandler officials and staff members have uh, said about the experience of having us in their community and we don't take that for granted that we have um, trusted public partners who based on their experience are willing to vouch for us and, and speak to their peers uh, and tell them about the positive experience that they've had for us. So thank you, Micah, I take the opportunity to say that. And and also just um, for those of you listening, let you know, like if you're in the private sector, um, you know, developing the trust with uh, your public sector partners is, is um, hard, it's a hard thing to, um, give specific advice on and, and tell you exactly a prescriptive formula on how to do it. But I think companies know, you know, what steps they could take to, to do that. And it's invaluable. Whatever you invest, you will get back many times over. Um, and for public sector folks who are listening, your voice is very important. Uh, cities look to each other. Um, they, they kind of steal policies and best practices from each other. And so, um, I think uh, thinking about how to be supportive of emerging industries, um, set the tone so that locally and beyond um, there's acceptance for this this new technology. You're more trusted than we could ever be with with your peer cities. Um, and Chandler's done that. And I think um, in the video you saw, uh, there was a reference to the policy that they adopted. They updated their zoning codes. I think Micah was 2018, maybe, uh, to... Um, uh, allow for, uh, it, it's now easier to convert parking spaces uh, to autonomous vehicle pickup and drop off zones. And that might not sound very exciting, but something practical like that both demonstrates support, demonstrates an understanding of our needs. Um, and you'd be surprised like that, that's more important than possibly like a lot of infrastructure upgrades or things that cost a lot of money, but it's, it's both setting a tone and streamlining the process of our, our daily operations in a community. And, and we worked on that together um, as we have done uh, many things. I'll, I'll pause here, but I, I would be happy if people are curious to give more examples of some specific um, collaborations that we've done with Chandler. No, Ellie, that was perfect. And, and I think we're gonna dive into some of those specific um, examples in, in a little bit, but you know, I, I love that idea of what you just painted. It's really, how do we transition from this transactional relationships and partnerships between industry and the city into a more long-term collaborative uh, partnership, right? Because sometimes you're, you're exactly right. It's the small things that kind of mean the most. And so I think that's a perfect opportunity to pivot to Brandon and, and the work you've been doing in Peachtree Corners. I mean, 
partnerships are obviously key to advancing smart city visions. And it's something really that I've been watching Peachtree for a long time because it's something that you and your team over there have done exceedingly well. How does the, how does the private sector work with local government? And how does the private sector work with Peachtree Corners really in order to advance some of these transportation systems and these emerging technologies that we saw on the video? And, and maybe talk to us about some of the challenges that you might have had along the way. Yeah, I think Ellie and Micah both got on very well. Um, and what I, I think the best thing that ever happened with really the, the evolution of smart cities is the private sector and the local governments really started to see a change of mindset. Um, it was no longer that transactional thing, as you said. It's how do we get to know that community better? How do we get to know the pain stakes of that community? How do we solve this together? and for, because we all know, right, government's not known for being innovators. We're, we're old school in what we do and how we operate. How do we start to change that? We know the private sector innovates really well. We know they come up with, you know, amazing things. Before it was, let me sell you that amazing thing. Now it's getting down to the personal level of each of that community and the threat of that community. We've seen that, we've done that with a few. Um, T-Mobile is a big part of what we're doing. Uh, we are, we've rolled out their 5G network, we're live and active. Um, they've made that investment here and they allow companies to come and test for free why they're, why they're doing it here. Um, and as we get into the transportation area, I think kind of what Chandler does as well, right? You take a small section, you figure out what works in those sections, you let the private industry come in, figure out how does this work in a real world environment? We've got labs all over the place. I'm sure Waymo's got closed course labs in, in many places, but how do you start to integrate this into the public where us as humans cause a lot of issues, right? We're not always the best of drivers. So how does that work when you, when you introduce the autonomous vehicles or in our case, we've got teleoperated e-scooters running around our streets. So, you know, you could be driving and you see an e-scooter with nobody on it driving right next to you on the road because it's going to pick up another rider and it's being driven by someone in Mexico City. So how do you integrate those with the traffic system and the, the signal with someone that's testing a new product on your signal for edge compute? Um, and so creating that environment where you're open to it um, and you're allowing the private sector to, to really test those things and allowing the government, as Ellie said, and, and the people have a voice in that. What does this mean for them on their daily life? Um, struggles doesn't always go well, right? So it is, you know, these are emerging technologies. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. You usually hear a lot when they don't. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then probably the biggest struggle from the private side is they, they are competitors. So sometimes getting competitors to work together can be a challenge. Um, but I think we're, we're also seeing that shift where companies know they can't be everything to everyone. Mm -hmm. And so if we start integrating these technologies together and work together, we can, we can achieve that goal. That's awesome. So sticking with the theme of partnership, I want to throw across to Jeff. You've been involved with the Institute for Automated Mobility here in Arizona since day one, which is a really interesting public-private partnership that actually brings in the three state universities as well. Would you be able to give us a little bit of a background and then so that what the IM is really trying to do here? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Diana. I was thinking this leads, it does lead quite well into how the IM um, what, what its objective is and how it was formed. I mean, it's, it is, as I said, it's a, a true public-private partnership. We've got government entities, we've got the public universities, th the three public universities in Arizona, as well as private industry, all sit with, with seats at the table um, and collaborating. It's really fascinating to have these different perspectives all coming together. Um, so it was formed in 2018 by executive order and its objective is really to provide guidance on policy and technology in the state to the state uh, to help with the, the prudent um, deployment of automated vehicles across the state. So uh, one of the things that we did um, was kind of look into the literature and see what is missing, what, what are the gaps there? And so the, the first project, that we, our first major project on which we focused was a metrics. So what do you need to do to measure uh, the safety, the operational safety of an automated vehicle as it navigates a given scenario? 
Um, so building from that, once you, so the old adage, you, you, you man, in order to manage, you must measure. Uh, so, but once you've measured, what do you do with those measurements? And so we'll lead it, the next step will be a an operational safety assessment methodology, the OSA methodology that will allow you to give a score. I mean, th this is kind of the long-term goal, give a score for an automated vehicle as it navigates that scenario, which will help build what's called a, a safety case. So to, the safety case being uh, what the, the the automated vehicle developer um, is building to, to provide the confidence to the public that they are their, their vehicle safe to be deployed on public roads. So that's kind of our long term goal. And the metrics is where we started. So, as you said, I've been there since day one. Uh, it's really been a fascinating experience and uh, you know, I'm, I'm so happy to be part of it. Just to, as a follow-up, are you able to give us a couple of concrete examples of the work that I am is doing today? So the, the metrics project, like like I said, the, so the metrics project it has three components to it. There's a, a metrics development and validation uh, pr portion to it. So what we did was we did a literature review of what metrics have been proposed there, both from a traffic engineering standpoint that's been going on for decades with human-driven vehicles, but then what are the metrics that are uh, being uh, that have been proposed for specifically automated vehicles. So from that, we kind of synthesized and developed a what we believe is the first comprehensive list of metrics that can be used both for automated vehicles but also human-driven vehicles. And we're in the process of validating those through simulation and uh, real-world testing. So the, the sec which leads to the second portion of it uh, of, of the metrics project, which is the data capture systems. So what we've folks we have a test bed up in Anthem, which is just north of Phoenix. Uh, so Maricopa County DOT, as well as University of Arizona, have been working on connected vehicle technology in this test bed for for a decade or, or so up there. We've kind of piggybacked on their work uh, to start doing some automated vehicle work there. So we're validating our metrics using the existing camera systems up there that are owned by uh, Maricopa County DOT. But we're looking at enhancing that data capture system with uh, potentially LIDAR, potentially radar, potentially diff additional cameras, always keeping in mind that if you can leverage existing infrastructure, that's the ideal situation. But on the other hand, you, you, don't, you don't maybe get the accuracy and precision that you need, and you de don't necessarily capture all the scenarios that you want to capture at night, inclement weather and, and the like. And then there's a third component, which is an AI and computer vision based algorithm um, being developed that will allows us to take the data from our data capture system and calculate the metrics. So all those three components go together into what we believe is a pretty unique uh, project. And I don't know of it being going on anywhere else in the world. So it's, that's, that's the project that my main focus these days and you know anytime i get taken away from it i'm like oh how do i get back to this project that's where i want to focus most of my time and energy so that, that's the main thing that that uh, i'm involved in at, with iam i mean it really does sound like you'll be setting the standards for the rest of the world through this project and it really does show you what I, so many different actors in the space can actually do yeah, I'd like to think so. I, and I, I also wear a hat. Um, I'm uh, the chair of the v, v Task Force, Verification Validation Task Force, under the SAE On-Road Automated Driving Committee, ORAD Committee. And so what, it's, what some of the, a lot of the work that we do with the IEM will we'll be sort of, sort of tossing over the fence to the ORAD Committee and the v, v Task Force to take, obviously, they'll, have to, they'll do some work on it. We'll have different perspectives there and start to develop some of those um, standards and, and, and best practices uh, in that standards committee. That's terrific. Uh, good stuff over there, Jeff. Really appreciate the insight and the work that IAM's doing. So, so Micah, you know, as we talk about, you know, automated vehicles and the future of cities, you know, I think during the video that played at the very beginning, you know, they talked about some of the, the projects that uh, the city of Chandler has been working on, especially around public safety. And I think Ellie mentioned the work around the zoning ordinances. Can you talk to a little bit about those programs and maybe other programs that Chandler is implementing to help you all as an organization and even your internal departments prepare for, you know, the, the deployment of automated vehicles at scale? Absolutely. And that's, I think, really where some of the, the municipal excitement really stems from. Um, when we look at how AVs will disrupt land use, I mean, that's really, to, to Brandon's point, uh, a lot of what municipalities are concerned about, building um, uh, infrastructure. If we don't have to have parking lots, 
uh, consume so much land, how can we repurpose that for alternative uh, uses, whether it's increased development, whether it's more open space, uh, or just additional land preservation. So um, the, the code changes to allow for a reduced parking requirements will, will allow up to a 40% reduction in parking requirements um, for developments that take autonomous vehicles into account, as well as ride share. Again, ride share, you don't need those vehicles there all the time. So um, it's also part of the component. So the built environment, specifically around parking, is something that we've taken a look at um, the pickup drop off zones. Um, you know, those are to, to Ellie's point, those are kind of simple solutions that don't really require much changes in the built environment. Um, other things we're taking a look at in the built environment, uh, it's related to EVs, but it's not directly related, is um, electrical conduit needed for EVs, electrical vehicles. So um, right now we're, we're pushing a lot. Of, we don't have anything in code, but we're really working with developers and um, organizations to think about at least putting the conduit in for electric vehicle charging stations uh, in anticipation of that technology being widely used. Um, it's easier to drop a pipe in the ground uh, and pull conduit later as opposed to tearing a roadway up. So those are some proactive things we're working with developers on. And, and around safety, our, our public safety departments, both police and fire, um, you know, Chandler Fire literally has written the book in collaboration with Waymo on how to respond to autonomous vehicle emergencies, where to cut, how to cut, how should um, autonomous vehicle engineers um, think about uh, public safety response. I mean, that's the other side. So that's where the collaboration comes in. Um, and then organizationally from a city of Chandler perspective, um, mayor, city council, and the city manager's office have really given uh, different directors and um, staff throughout the city the, the leeway to come up with ideas to aid in the advance and development of this technology. So it, part of it's just a mindset, I think, in really driving um, uh, new technology innovation. City of Chandler embraces innovation. We, you know, we're not gonna um, get behind a technology solution um, specifically, but if it's broad-based enough where we can say, yep, this makes sense for our uh, community as well as region because streets just don't stop at municipal boundaries. How does this work across boundaries? And I know Dai has done a lot of work with this at ASU as well as how do communities and regions think about this stuff. Um, that, that's something that Chandler takes a lot of pride in is coming up with ideas and to, how to make this accessible to a lot of different individuals and organizations without having to recreate the wheel. So those are some of the things we're doing. We're, we're, we're looking at a few other things right now. Um, but again, it's just having an open mind and being willing to, to look at things a little bit differently, I think. No, I think that's brilliant. I think that's well said. You know, you just provided kind of some concrete tangible steps that other cities wherever they may be can take to really help encourage you know the adoption or the implementation of, of avs it doesn't always have to be that big built environment but it could be as something as little as looking at your you know your zoning codes and your regulations i think that was brilliant advice and it's 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 good because that's stuff as you mentioned that cities understand and are used to working with and that's steps they can take to help uh, implement the, this emerging technology. So thank you for that. Ellie, to, to kind of piggyback uh, on that and, and just to say congratulations um, on the launch of what the first fully automated commercial service in the United States, I believe, right? Can in the you, world, yeah. In the world, um, yeah, why am I, why, why am I limiting it to, to the United States and the world? Uh, yeah. Terrific, <laughs> terrific achievement. Thank you, you for mentioning that. Yeah, that was this October in, um, in Chandler and the, the East Valley. Now members of the public can download the Waymo app and uh, fully, not just driverless in terms of our software, but no one in the front seat, um, to totally empty car will uh, arrive once you hail the, the car on your app, arrive to pick you up and bring you to your destination. So very exciting. And if you're in um, the East Valley, you should give it a try. Um, so yes, I think uh, you might have seen me nodding to many of the things that Michael was saying. I think that the mindset is 
I, you know, I have colleagues who work at the state level and at the federal level or internationally. And the way I often describe it is that at the um, city level, there aren't actually a lot of laws that govern autonomous vehicles. The rules of the road tend to be set at the state level. The rules around vehicle safety tend to be set at the federal level. And so at the local level, it's less about regulation um, and legislation and more about collaboration. Um, you don't have to, a technology doesn't have to be explicitly um, banned to be uh, run out of town. If it's extremely unpopular, local officials find a way to make something infeasible, right? Um, and so you, you need, even if you are technically allowed to be in a community, you need to have the support uh, and, and partnership of the city representatives who help build the support of the, um, the community. Uh, and, and I think um, Micah spoke to, to that. Um, I will say, I don't want to give those who are here today the impression that that's, that's the only thing that is needed to bring us to town. The expansion of our technology is very incremental, very slow. It's going to be a long time before, you now you can go to Chandler and you can experience this technology today. It's not gonna be imminent that we are in all American cities or cities everywhere, um, no matter how welcoming a community is um, and how much you know they um, uh, support us with infrastructure upgrades or something like that. So I just wanna set the expectations that because of the very deliberate way that we roll this technology out, will be, uh, depends on where you are, but you your city might see this arrive in the near term or the midterm or the long term. And um, the other thing I often try to take the opportunity to clarify is that not all AV companies use the exact same technology. Um, I will speak just for Waymo, not for any of our peer companies, when I say that uh, we are not building um, a service that is dependent on special infrastructure. We're building to the infrastructure of uh, today, um, which means that we're not limited to places that have 5G or special sensors or anything like that. Um, what is very attractive about a place like Chandler is, is how well maintained the, the roads are. All of the things that help human drivers help us, well-marked streets, um, clear signage, things like that. Um, on the other hand, we actually do seek out learning in environments where that's not the case. Uh, we go to um, places that offer inclement weather potholes specifically so that we can test our technology in those environments and make sure that we're capable of, of handling them as well. But um, I think just, you know, want to make it clear that there's different factors that, that um, uh, have made it, have made the East Valley, Chandler specifically, such a great place to operate. Um, but some things are like Chandler's been a fabulous partner and then some things are a little bit out of their hands and have just been, it's worked really well, um, uh, fortunately. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Sounds like it's been a really unique and wonderful partnership. Um, and it's great to see it in our own backyard. I wanna now turn over to Brandon. And as we heard in the introduction, automated vehicles are part of your economic development play. And obviously the city has had a large investment. I think it was $5 million that we heard. Given that we're now in the midst of a need for a real economic development play, how is Peachtree Corners going to partner and what is your vision, especially on the automated vehicle front, moving forward? Yeah, it was obviously a unique uh, way to approach economic development, a little outside of your normal recruitment, retain, expand, um, which you know every city does and still needs to do, uh, and we continue to do that. But as we thought of a, you know, something different to attract. And when we think about economic development, right, we, we tend to think about those big wins, right? The, the Waymo's of the world, the IBM's of the world, the, the thousands of jobs that come. But here we, we think about what is what are the small attributes that create economic development? So if we had like local motors, they came, they tested here for five months well, they employed staff here, they stayed in hotels, they ate in our restaurants. All these companies that come to use the facility are, are spending money in our city. So that's indirect sources for economic development. 
It doesn't have to be the big win. You can make those incremental growth. And we have been fortunate in the year and few months that we have been open. We have we have had the big wins. We've had over we've had two companies relocate corporate global headquarters here, uh, brought over 450 jobs, took 125,000 square feet of office space off the market. Um, and one of them is ASHRAE, so American Standard for Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Engineers. So you're like, what does that have to do with autonomous vehicles? Well, smart buildings, right? They're the engineers who build out the infrastructure that supplies heating and air to the buildings. So they wanted to be a part of the ecosystem here. How do, how do you take the outside information, pull it into the buildings and build that? So they actually took a 1967 building and made it net zero and use it as a showcase. It's now a training center. So now they're bringing in all the engineers from around the globe to come into Peachtree Corners to train them on this new emerging technology. So I think from a city perspective, we sometimes have to think outside of the box. Chandler does a great job of that, of how do you take you know, technology, how do you use this from an economic development driver? And as we look forward uh, and continue to expand, it's gonna be in Probably the startup market is where we see the biggest growth. We're starting to see more and more ideas. The best thing about a, a COVID environment, right, is people have time. They've, they've come, they're coming up with new ideas. How do we solve these problems, these new problems that we're facing? And mobility is going to be a big play in that, right? We saw public transportation take a humongous hit. We've got buses running around completely empty because people are using Uber because they don't want to share a bus. They're, they're going to call a Waymo vehicle because they can use it with just the, themselves and their rider. Um, Micro mobility is playing a big part in that. So how do we bring all that together? And we, we see it as economic development driver as a place that they can all come here to figure this out together and grow. No, those are perfect examples. And, and I love that concept. It doesn't always have to be the big win. It could be, you know, small incremental growth that really helps sustain sustain a community or a city. Micah, you know, can you mention some of the economic development kind of results and benefits that the city of Chandler experienced or maybe that you uh, foresee the city experiencing coming out of, you know, COVID, the recession, and as we move towards recovery from, from your progressive stance when it comes to automated vehicles? Yeah, it, it, I completely agree with Brand. Everybody is always looking for that home run or that unicorn to come in and change their the economic trajectory of their community when in reality it's it's a bunch of singles that really put runs on the board um so we've seen a lot of benefits absolutely we've seen a lot of companies again on the on the smaller side they're they're startup companies they are um, individuals who have worked at legacy companies in chandler who have spun out and started to do their own things within uh, the AV space, but even with our, our traditional primes and larger companies, the amount of commu um, not commuting, computing power it takes to make an autonomous vehicle function, they're going to need chips for that. So it's helping sustain in advance what we already have. So like I said earlier, we had the, the basic ingredients that go into building an autonomous vehicle. Um, with some slight tweaks and changes and, and how it comes together to uh, make the actual vehicle work. And so we're seeing more diversification within the supply chain that feeds into autonomous vehicle and more work for our, our existing company. So it, it's really just diversifying the end product. Um, you know, I, I really think we're, we're, we're also betting on AV being a multi-trillion dollar future economic impact. We're still in the infancy stages of this, um, and that's part of our bet also, right? So we can't read the future, but we have a pretty good hunch that AV and EV technology is going to really, I hate using the term, advance in, the, <laughs> in, this, in the next few decades. So you know, just trying to support what we have, project that Chandler is a community that is welcoming and open to new ideas and technology in this space and getting that message out there. Earlier, we were talking about CES and being at the trade shows and talking to other companies. And um, you know that, that's kind of what my job in the economic development world is, is positioning Chandler as a destination for these industries in the future. So I really think we're only scratching the surface as to the, the economic benefit communities will derive from AV 
technology in the future. Definitely. What great points. Love it. And if I could add just maybe two quick thoughts, um, which is that, uh, you know, cities may not have the um, like full legislative control of the, this, this uh, industry. They certainly have an influential voice with um, the decision makers that do. Um, federal and state officials really want to hear from local leaders who are experiencing this tech firsthand because it's happening in very small pockets, not a lot of people. It's normal now for um, the uh, residents of the East Valley to see a Waymo driving around. That's uh, highly unusual for most folks. So they um, need to hear uh, from local uh, folks at, so that state and federal um, policies can be supportive and allow the local um, development to, to flourish. Um, and I had another thought, but I've forgotten it. So, <laughs> no worries. I thought added that was to that point. Oh, sorry. Maybe, maybe added to that, to add on to what Ellie was saying, um, she, she's absolutely right where AVs have been normalized in certain areas of the world. There are other places in the country that are still thinking this is not real, um, not doable. And uh, an anecdotal story is um, our fire chief uh, was is serving on a national committee or something and very similar to this type of conversation. And a fire chief from a very large prominent city was saying, you know, this technology is not gonna be here for years. And my fire chief was like, wait a minute, it's here, they're rolling around, we're working with them. And so it, it is coming and people kind of, to Ellie's point, need to start thinking about how they're gonna um, interact with the companies and with the legislative um, officials that govern how the technology rolls out. It's here. Uh, I'll add what's, what's happening with the IEM is we've got um, MAG, which is the Maricopa Association of Governments and PEG, the Pima Association of Governments as IEM members or at least joining as IEM members. So that's a, another way that cities get, get a seat at the table and, and get, uh, you know, get their voice to be heard in, the, in this space as well. Yeah, 100%. I think, you know, it, it's almost difficult. We, we love to use Chandler as an example for the rest of just the regional communities, but could you imagine now trying to share these best practices across the world? But that's, again, I think, you know, the, one of the positive outcomes of, of the COVID is things like this, right? Being able to get us all on a Zoom call with people from six continents um, as I mentioned in the chat, this is going to be recorded and shared. So we're really excited to, to be able to give you all the platform to share these best practices and knowledge and advice. So Jeff, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. Um, you know, I think Ellie mentioned it earlier. Uh, and then uh, Micah mentioned EV infrastructure and, and the importance of EV infrastructure and, and kind of the AV EV conversation need to be progressed together. Um, what are the, some of the biggest challenges facing the um, I guess, large scale deployment of electric vehicles in your mind. And, and what are some of the things that cities, as Mike mentioned, you know, think about the uh, conduits. What are some other things that cities might want to keep front of mind as they're looking to more widely deploy electric vehicles in their communities? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And it's kind of the, 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 the billion or trillion dollar, dollar question at this point, right? Um, EVs have been around. I was back in 2010, I was feverishly working on the blink charging stations. We were trying to get them in the ground uh, December 2010, when the Nissan Leaf and Chevrolet Volt were, were coming out, che we were working with Chevrolet and Nissan. They wanted the, the, these stations in the ground to give people some some confidence that they could buy these vehicles and, and find charging because range anxiety was was if, if it's big now, it was huge back then. Mm -hmm. um, so we've come a long way, but we still need to be ha we still need to have that infrastructure in the ground. We've uh, the, uh, the early adopters tended to be. I guess higher on the socioeconomic ladder, so they they tend to be able to charge at home. But now there are a lot of people in cities, not just in, in North America, but in more crowded European cities, that can't charge in their garage. They don't have that that five foot uh, access to a charging point, so they park on the street. So how do you get them charging? So that that is really challenging from an EV standpoint. Um, so I think that what Mike has said about the the conduit, having the conduit there, having the the standards in place for individual cities so that any new building has at least a certain, they're already prepared, they're pre-wired for a given number of EVs. So if you're building an apartment building, for example, a certain number of parking spaces have that 
pre-wiring. So you don't necessarily have to have the EV charging stations installed already, although that would be great, but at least pre-wired so that you could do that. So I think there, that is a huge component of what cities can do. And then from the OEM perspective, there's still the, the, the cost of the batteries need to come down, but, but, but they are, right? Um, and I think that 2021, I'm, you know, I've been in, this, in the EV space for probably 15 years or so, and it's really the end of 2020, or maybe midway through 2020, when I saw a real shift. It wasn't just me and my, my fellow EV enthusiasts talking about EVs. It was the general public has started to talk about EVs. I really see that 2021, um, I mean, I'd, I'd probably have a, a huge bias, but I really see 2021 as the year that EVs go mainstream. So um, I think that there's been, a, there's been a lot of progress in the last 10 years, uh, both from the charging stations for, to the EV performance, um, and I really think that that's, it, it's, we're turning the corner at this point. Well, I want to build a little on that. Um, we do have an EV at home and we went on a road trip over the winter break and it, it meant I spent a lot of time in Carl's Junior car parks as we were charging up the vehicle going place to place. So my understanding, Brandon, is Peachtree Corners is thinking about the location of these charging stations a little differently from what we've seen traditionally. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you're doing. Yeah, and our focus has really been multi-pronging this because we do see this market exponentially growing, especially in our area. Um, so one, we, it really goes back to our earlier conversation about partnerships um, and, and really where we're traditionally the general public thinks of fast charging, they think about it on the highway system, right? I got to drive a long way, I need to pull in, I need to fast charge. Well, we, we pinged our partners and said, hey, why don't we look at this differently? What about putting fast charging in our downtown, in our town center? People are coming to eat lunch. They're coming to go shopping. They're there for 45 minutes to an hour. Why not let them fast charge there? So we just cut the ribbon two weeks ago on the largest fast charging site in Metro Atlanta. So we've got 16 DC fast chargers up and running in our downtown. And they, the use rate of these chargers has surpassed their expectation already within just two weeks of being open. And the comments that we're getting back are, this is great. I can go eat while my car is charging. You should go check out their town green that they built and go see a concert. So we're, we're already seeing that, uh, which I think is going to only help as these companies. And that was Tesla and Electrify America who made that investment. So they took that investment fully on them, their, themselves. And then we've taken really the level two charging side of it. How do we as government go into our parks where people we know are going to stay for a little longer while they're playing? Do we go um, and work with the local mixed use development where we're starting to see EV adoption in that in that bracket? Um, we're deploying at our local gyms where you know people are gonna stay for maybe a little longer, hour, hour and a half, so they can plug in there. Um, and we just and we saw the biggest struggle for the home charging market was education. When people bought an EV and they went to go get a home charger, they had no idea. There were so many options. What do I do with all this? What's the right one? And so we put out uh, RFI and received back 19 responses and we're putting together a document to send out to our local businesses and our residents that kind of break down each of the offerings from the EVSE providers. You know, do you want it to integrate with your Alexa and tell them to charge? at 2 a.m. when you have the cleanest power during the day? Or do you just want to come in and plug in? So we'll build that. Um, so we're kind of seeing it from both sides, commercial, fast charging, using it for economic development, drawing people there, and then supporting the growth of EVs. Phenomenal. Uh, Ellie, do you want, I saw in the chat that you, you know, put something about the importance of uh, EV infrastructure. Do you want to just um, speak to that just a little bit in case people might've missed it in the chat? Sure, I was um, saying that while I previously had said Waymo does not need special infrastructure to operate, that's true in terms of our autonomous vehicle technology, our ability to actually drive. But um, we have a fleet that is a mixture of hybrid, plug-in electric, and fully electric cars. And we are looking ahead and, and seeing that um, we're, we're not selling vehicles. We own and manage a fleet of, of vehicles that people can hail. Um, and so we need uh, infrastructure to support our charging. And the infrastructure at the scale for our long-term plans isn't there yet. So that is one area that 
well, we're really hoping we can work with the public sector to to support uh, the growth of. And um, as has been said, I think you know there's a lot of momentum there. We just need to to see it keep going. That's May fantastic. I take you back off that one a little bit? We know the Biden administration has got big plans in terms of infrastructure. And so I'm going to direct this to each and everyone. If you had a wish list for the Biden administration in terms of one or two pieces for infrastructure, what would that be? I'll start with you, Ali. Um, I think EV infrastructure and just an open line of communication. You know, we um, are excited. Uh, I, I have to stop thinking of him as Mayor Pete um, and uh, as Secretary uh, Pete, but we're, we're really excited about um, what we understand his perspective on new transportation technology, specifically AVs to be, but, um, you know, a uh, whole new incoming uh, Department of Transportation. And um, I think that we're going to have to do a lot of like learning about each other and figuring out what their priorities are. But from what Biden has put out so far, very excited about the, their emphasis on the infrastructure. Brandon, your thoughts? I'll have to go regional on this one, right? I think fiber regionally is, is going to be a key to aspect that's going to help states overall, right? We're seeing this mass exodus into cities away from our rural areas. But now with COVID, now that we can work from home, now that we can work from everywhere, what that I think we're starting to see that move out of the inner city, out and back into our rural areas but they need the broadband, the fiber to, to be able to support that and continue to grow those communities. And then that's where we start getting into the regional plays. Mike has said, streets don't stop at our city boundaries. They keep going. So we've got to be able to support that whole mobility sector throughout the entire region, not just our city. Thank you. I'll go to Jeff and then Mike are on this one. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? I've got a, a mute, so I think perfect. Um, I, well, it's a little bit different tack if you'll allow me to add. Uh, a couple of things I would do on the wish list from a policy standpoint would be, um, so my, my home country, Canada, I think, Ellie, I'm, I think you might be from Canada as well. Uh, no, but I went to college the, there, and sometimes oh, yeah. I, my accent, you okay. can that. <laughs> <laughs> nice, but I get called, called out all the time as well. Uh, up in Canada, they just put in a ZV mandate um, kind of not quite the same as California's, but I'd like to see a federal one. So a real, uh, it, it, we, we've seen in California, the results there, uh, the, how it's caused a lot more, the sales in California compared to the rest of the country are, are it's, it's night and day. So I would do that uh, as well as I would right now, um, the early movers like Tesla uh, are actually are being a bit penalized because the, uh, the rebate uh, or, or the, the tax credit for the EV tax credit, it, it goes starts going down after you've sold your 200,000 uh, vehicle. And so now Tesla vehicles, you, you don't get that tax credit anymore. So there's there's been this, some discussion of, of uh, eliminating that limit or doing something and even cr changing it from a tax credit to a point of sale rebate. So those are two things that I would love to see. I'd love to see the Biden administration do. I'm not sure if it's going to happen, but that would be, you said wish list. So that, that's, that's my, those are my wishes. Diana, would you mind asking the question again? I was reading um, Jeff's comment. I don't think I caught the whole question. <laughs> it basically boils down to, if given the Biden administration is going to do some large scale investment in infrastructure, what would that look like in terms of your wish list? One or two items for them. Okay, that makes perfect sense. And I should have been able to pick that up from the previous three comments, but. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it's, it, it really revolves around the, the EV side of this. Um, you know, that energy has to be generated somewhere to propel these vehicles. And given um, Arizona and Chandler's geographic uh, location with lots of sunlight, um, I think you know investments in that type of infrastructure that could be then transferred into um, EV, AV is really paramount because that energy has to come from somewhere, whether that's fossil fuels or um, natural gas or you know nuclear. There's got to be other alternatives. So getting the power there to move these vehicles, I think, is going to be very critical. Um, other policy things is, I think, at the state and national level, 
we really need to um, take a good hard look at R&D tax credits. Um, for years, though, that has been neglected. Um, Arizona has done a lot of good things to increase R&D tax credits, um, but the cost of developing new products is substantial. And if the U.S. in general is going to maintain our leadership position um, or even fall behind us in areas, which we have, we really need to encourage this R&D to take place onshore and reward these companies for doing it here. Um, it, it's, it's an investment in ourselves, it's an investment in our economy, and that's the big one I would really encourage our, our federal partners to take a look at is let's really support the onshore R&D. I think that's a perfect if they don't have tax liability. Let's figure out a way to string it out to where, you know, if they do have um, a liability in the future and maybe even create a, a full open market for those credits so that they could then sell it and receive income to reinvest back into their R and D. So anything creative around R and D. That's awesome. I think that's a, a perfect way to kind of close the session out. I feel like we could have talked uh, for the rest of the afternoon, but yeah, let's encourage innovation. And I think, all of the panelists, as you've seen today, are encouraging innovation in their own ways, in their own communities. Uh, and so this has just been a fabulous conversation. I want to thank all of you for joining us today uh, on the third day of the ASU Winter Games. Uh, I think you really get that Olympic feel uh, from all the panelists and, and the sense of collaboration and partnerships that are really driving uh, the future of automated mobility forward. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we are recording this, so we'll send these wish lists up to Biden and his administration, and hopefully we might get a win or two. Who knows? <laughs> but thank you all. It's been a fabulous time, uh, and we'll talk soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Diana. Thanks, Tom. Yeah.